G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we approach the 2023 AFL Draft. Yes, I'm obviously making as many videos about this as possible because I'm excited for a start. Uh, and today I realized this is a video that I've done in previous years. Teams that have a particular need to get this draft right. I've it's done it in previous years and I kind of realized approaching this year's draft, I've done every other kind of video I can think of except this year's edition of this video. So as always, you know, the draft is an important avenue to get talent for every team. However, I think you can make examples of clubs that probably have placed more emphasis or more importance on this year's draft or this year's draft as part of a, of a series of drafts because of the specific like position that, that club is in. So in this video, I've got five examples of clubs that are really at a precarious or somewhat precarious point in uh, their list transition or rebuild or whatever you want to call it. And therefore, the 2023 draft presents as a really important one for them. As always, guys, before I get into it, if you could consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, that would be much appreciated. I'm gunning for that 24K subscriber mark by the day of the draft, and I'm about 200 odd short as it currently stands. So anything you can do to help would be much appreciated. Cool, so let's start off with the most obvious one, and that is my club, the West Coast Eagles. This is obviously a really important draft to get right for a number of reasons. Uh, let's look generally at the fact that Obviously, the rebuild has probably started in earnest. Probably at the back end of 2021 is where I would consider the, the moment clicked where West Coast had to transition the list to push towards more youth. And that's a byproduct of partially being successful through that late teens era. And then of course, trading for Tim Kelly just meant that the avenues to getting young talent onto the list dried up because we traded it away a number of first and second round picks. We went three years in a row without a first round draft pick. And then suddenly when the premiership window, if you want to call it that, I don't know if a premiership window retrospectively was still open in 2021 because uh, that was where the, the ass kind of fell out of the team. But it was the moment in time where we realized, okay, the, the end is coming quicker than we had expected for a variety of reasons. And uh, suddenly we are at a point where we need to transition um, you know, young players into the team. And we found that the young players that we had weren't really up to scratch because we hadn't been drafting well in previous seasons. So that's left us at a precarious point where we need to inject youth and pretty quick. And when I say quick, I mean, there's no prescribed time that a rebuild needs to take, but I do kind of believe that you, you wanna leave yourself a small enough window at the bottom of the ladder so that it doesn't become the norm. You wanna stay around the bottom of the ladder enough to get the adequate amount of draft picks that you need to build your next premiership list and we more or less are starting from scratch other than a few exceptions like probably Oscar Allen he's probably one that's young enough to be considered part of the next group but West Coast needed to get as many young talents into the list as possible and I think they've done a pretty good job over the last few years of adding you know extra first turning pick two into two first rounders last year adding extra seconds through live trading and stuff like that I think they've made up ground on the Tim Kelly trade pretty well but we come at a time now where West Coast hold pick one in this year's draft it is arguably the best ever number one pick to hold ever with the you know the talented Harley Reid on offer. It looks like that is the way they're gonna go. And so there is an added pressure really to get this particular draft right. And they're kind of in an unfortunate circumstance where as the worst team of the competition this year, we don't have anywhere near as good a draft hall or draft hand as someone like a North Melbourne. And, and partially, you know, I, that's not a complaint about how that's come to pass. Obviously, they lost Ben Mackay, and then, you know, they've been so bad over a number of years that they get awarded priority picks. But the, the, regardless of that, the end result is that we have a second pick around pick 29 in a year where the draft is heavily compromised. So despite the fact that we have pick one and Harley Reid, the rest of our draft hand isn't particularly strong. And so again, with the, with the view of trying to get this club back on its feet as quickly as possible, nailing this draft and maybe even next year's draft is gonna be essential to West Coast. Anyway, I've banged on about them long enough. Let's talk about the other uh, bottom two side in North Melbourne. Again, this presents as an important draft. They're, they're in different spaces at the moment, North Melbourne and West Coast. Obviously North Melbourne have been down the bottom of the ladder for a little bit longer and uh, in essence have, have been able to add a little bit more talent um, across the board over the last, well, probably the last five to seven drafts. You know, they've kept most of their first rounders in that period. I don't think they took a first in 2019, but for the most part, there's been an accumulation of talent there, which makes them a little bit different to West Coast. And therefore, if you're just looking at it from a logical point of view, 
it would make sense that North Melbourne are closer to jumping up the ladder than West Coast. So we do know that footy doesn't always work like that. So while there's maybe less pressure on this particular draft, I'd argue that there is still a fair amount of pressure because, you know, first of all, this is arguably the best draft hand North Melbourne has ever held. They have five first round draft picks. They have pick two, pick three, uh, pick 15, 17, and 18 as well. That will probably become three, four, 20, 22, and 23 uh, if you take out academy or if you add in academy bids. So we saw to some extent, I think we can conclude, at least in my opinion, that they've got picks two and three perfectly right last year or picks three and four with Sheasel and Wardlaw. So they're in a position to be able to replicate that to some extent. And with the strength of draft hand that they have, there is pressure to get it right because while North have accumulated those talents, there's still question marks on a lot of the players that they picked up. So, you know, in 2021, that draft has taken a massive hit with Jason Horn Francis already leaving. Now, that did get them Harry Sheasel, but when you look at 2021, where they had pick one, sure, they added, you know, a couple of decent players. I think Paul Curtis was part of that, and there's somebody else. Then you look at 2020, and guys like Will Phillips and Tom Powell, they look decent, but they're still very much unknown. So, there is still a desire or a clear need to get young talent onto the list. In particular, when you consider the lack of talls on that list. So we've got Nick Larkey there. He's an absolute star. But around that, a lot of their talent is based around medium to small types. So getting that list balanced right, this is an important draft for them to get right. And this would serve as a really strong platform for someone like Clarko to look at this list and build it to being that next finals competitive team. And for the record, I think he will. I have faith that Clarko will be able to restore North Melbourne to being this this competitive team over a number of years. You know, the, the Brad Scott side never really elevated themselves to being genuine premiership contenders at any point, but they were in and around finals for most of that time. So at the very least, North Melbourne will be back, but I think this draft serves an important opportunity for them. Now let's talk about Richmond. This is also an important draft for the Richmond Footy Club, as I have talked about previously on this channel a fair amount. And in general, the media has generally sort of made this point as well, uh, that they're just at an awkward list point. You know, they obviously had a, a long premiership window. They won three flags out of four. Ridiculously strong team. One of the greatest teams of the modern era. They were able to, you know, on the back end of some really top end drafting, sort of around that 20 or 2009 to 2000 and probably even earlier than that. Like when you look at Jack Rewalt, Alex Rance, Dustin Martin, those guys were taken around that era throughout the 20 teens. Richmond really were able to replenish their list through late drafting. And I made this point in a previous video, but there was one uh, one year, I forget the exact year now, where they had four rookie selections and all four of them became premiership players. They also took Dan Butler really late in that draft. He became a premiership player for them. So their ability to draft late has been an absolute strength for the Richmond Footy Club. And there's a tendency, if I'm not mistaken, to go mature as well. But what we've seen now is that they've kind of prolonged that uh, premiership window or attempted to by uh, getting Taranto and Hopper, a clear intention to try and remain competitive in the short term, and it cost them draft picks. Now, that's not a criticism of that decision because I think that will play out over time. And Richmond has only dipped, well, they missed finals in 21, and I think they fell a big way again in 23, despite making finals in 22. So could they sort of surge back into finals? If Damien Hardwick's at the helm, I would suggest there's a chance. I think this point though, Richmond have to brace for potentially a couple of years in the lower regions of the ladder. So the awkward point they have at this point in time is that they don't have high draft picks having traded them. So they enter the draft here at 32, 43, and 50, although I think that's, that's um, weighted for academy bids. And when you factor in last year as well, they entered the draft at pick 49, and then their second pick was at 55. They took a couple of small sort of defenders from WA in Caleb Smith and Steely Green. So this, again, there is a clear need for Richmond to get young talent onto their list. And therefore this draft, I'm not saying that there's pressure for them to unearth absolute gun premiership stars from picks 32, 43, and 50, but they need to get something out of it. They need to be able to add someone to their list who in the short to medium term looks like he has some promise and could be part of the next team. I have no idea if Caleb Smith and Sealy Green from last year are going to project as long-term players. It's too early to tell. But some value needs to be taken out of this draft. I think they're probably in a position where they could go tall or small. It would probably make sense, the more I think about it, for them to pick at least one or two talls in this year's draft with a midfield heavy draft coming up next year. They did draft pretty heavy in 2021. They took Gibkiss in the first round. They took a number of second rounders. Tom Brown was also a late first rounder. And then guys like Tyler Sonzi, um, a little bit later, Sam Banks comes to mind. 
But again, we just haven't really seen the, like the fruits of these players developing yet. And it is early days, but they need to add to that with something meaningful this year. And I think this is an important draft for Richmond to not just pass over and get nothing out of. Now let's talk about the Melbourne Football Club. And uh, this one is an outlier. When you compare it to obviously West Coast and North Melbourne, their needs to get young talent onto the list is a little bit more obvious. Same thing with Richmond. I think those are different cases to be made for those clubs. With Melbourne, I'd argue this is somewhat important purely because when you look at their list composition now and the fact that it's hard to see Melbourne dropping off a cliff anytime soon. I will point out, I know I predicted them as my slider in next year's ladder, but that's kind of just a rough call on picking a good team to slide because there is one every year. I'm not making that analyzing their list and seeing reasons why they're not good enough to make the eight. So in terms of general list profile on talent, they should be in the mix for uh, premiership for the next three or four years when you've got players in their prime like Oliver and Petrarca in particular, amongst a whole host of others, they should be sweet. So on that logic, if they're going to have what you'd expect to be high finishes for the next number of years, it becomes important for them for their overall list transition if they want to avoid a circumstance where they end up like Richmond or West Coast now, West Coast is the most extreme example, then it's important for them while they hold what is currently pick six will become pick eight from Fremantle. I think there is a bit of an impetus on them to try and get this right. Well, obviously they're gonna try and get it right, but there is some degree of pressure there. So uh, while I, I would highlight as well, I, I think it's really good that they've added some tools in recent years, in particular young key forwards in Van Royen and uh, Matthew Jefferson last year. I can't speculate on how good Jefferson's gonna be. I think we can conclude John Van Royen looks like an absolute gun. But we consider as well, the pick at eight that they currently hold this year was compensation for losing Luke Jackson, who was a pick three in the 2019 draft. So getting that right, I think there is a degree of importance on that and it will help them massively in terms of their list transition because if they don't draft well, they're going to fall off a cliff like other clubs have. There's also the, the other fact here that they traded picks 14, 27, and 35 to upgrade to pick 11. So a three pick upgrade, they gave away two second rounders for it. Obviously that speaks to their, their rating of this year's draft and they want to get two picks and then probably dip out of the draft fairly early. So when you've given up that level of capital, I think there is even greater pressure for them to get that pick right. So overall, I think Melbourne is one of those teams where there is more pressure on them to nail this draft than other clubs. And the fifth team that I'll nominate as needing a good draft this year is the Geelong Football Club. Obviously coming off a long period of success. And when I say success, I don't just mean being competitive in finals. I mean, they've been around the mark for top four and obviously grabbed a grand final or premiership win, sorry, in 2022. Uh, at least one lost grand final in that time. So they're at the point now with, you know, Joel Selwood retiring, for instance, Isaac Smith retiring. Uh, the the transition is starting to happen. We've expected it for a number of years. Their veterans just kept playing, not only playing on, but playing well. Tom Hawkins can't have too much longer left. I, th I think the case to be made for Geelong needs some young talent. It kind of makes itself. And we, we know that Geelong know this. This has been, I think I heard Andrew Mackey talking about it on uh, afl.com.au. I think it's been fairly well broadcasted. Geelong's strategy right now is to try and replenish some young talent. Doesn't have to be 18 year olds, but young players. So some young midfielders that have added in recent times, have obviously traded for Tanner Brun. They drafted Max Holmes. That was a pretty good selection at pick 20. Jai Clark last year was their earliest draft pick in a long time. Mitch Nevitt as a guy that's come in as a midfielder and played a few games. Um, they've added some decent looking talls as well, in particular Sam DeConing, but then you got guys like Shannon Neal and Toby Conway. So it's not as though they've ignored the draft in recent times. What I will say though, is there hasn't been too many opportunities for them to get high draft picks. The only access to high draft picks that they got was after winning the premiership, Gold Coast decided to hand them pick eight on a silver platter, something that still annoys me. So that was their highest draft pick in a long time. And this year, obviously we saw them fall down the ladder a little bit and they currently hold, I think pick eight, but that will become pick 10. So again, a rare opportunity to take a draft pick in the top 10. And the thing is, I will say, there's no guarantee Geelong are going to plummet into the bottom four you know, next year. They've still got a very, very strong best 22. At times, they looked a little bit flat and listless this year, but their top end talent is still extreme. When you consider a forward line still has um, Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins in it, uh, Brian Myers is coming off a career best season, Tyson Stengel's in there. That's just their forward line, by the way. There's too much top end talent, and with Geelong's culture, like I'm not gonna bet on them finishing bottom four. So my point there is, it might not be a given thing that Geelong are going to have continued access to high draft picks. So pick 10 
might be you know as good a draft pick as they're going to have over the next couple of years. This draft presents as a really good opportunity for them to inject some uh, some quality talent. Now the thing that Geelong seems to have more so than most other clubs is that they're a bit they have this ability to attract players to their club. You know they've had Jeremy Cameron walk to them. Uh, they've had Pat Dangerfield join as well via trade back in 2015. Those are just the two top liners that come to mind, but you know, a whole host of players. Gary Rowan requested a trade there. Not all of them have worked out. You know, there's like Sean Higgins, Jack Stephen, uh, Luke Dowhouse, but either way, you know, players are still lining up to go to, to play for the Geelong Cats because they're a strong organization and they've earned that. So that's not a that's not a um, swipe at them or anything like that. So that does play in their favour, and you get the sense that barring something like a cataclysmic um, collapse of the club, like like West Coast, um, that then they're always going to have that advantage to some extent. So that being said, they can replenish their list through other ways. Tanner Bruin, Jack Bowes, they wanted to go play for the Geelong Cats. That being said, the draft still remains the best and most efficient way and cost-effective way of getting top-end talent to your list. And therefore, they still need to prioritize the draft and obviously can't rely on just trading in superstars every now and then because it's expensive. And uh, obviously, there's still some risk involved in that. Therefore, this draft is an important one for the Cats to get right because it's their best opportunity, maybe for a little while now, to get top-end young talent onto their list. And it will serve them well that in a couple of years when they've lost Hawkins, Rowan, uh, whoever else is left on that very strong list, there'll be better place for it because they'll have some semi-mature plays on that list. But anyway, guys, that was just my rambling about five clubs who need to get this draft right. So in summary, West Coast and North Melbourne, obvious. Richmond, also obvious. Geelong, also obvious. And Melbourne, that one was probably more a little bit left field, but um, but I still am happy with my reasons for that. So let me know in the comments section what you agree with and disagree with. Um, if you go for one of those five clubs, what outcomes are you hoping from this particular draft. So as always, I appreciate you watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.